Good evening. I'm glad you were all glad you're all uh, here tonight. The topic for tonight is entitled Jewish Pirates. Now, yes, there will come up in the talk daring sea captains who ferociously bombarded and boarded ships with sails at full reach upon the main masts and cutlasses at the ready, but that would be a very limited discussion. The phenomena of Jewish pirates are one of the more colorful facets of the Jewish experience in Europe as the continent found its way forward towards modernity. In fact, the Europe we know could not have left the Middle Ages had Jews not been there to make it possible. Now, before we proceed, a few words about the history we're examining. Much of what we expect for a proper study of history is, well, not entirely at hand. Yes, we can cite dates and look at what was happening around the more proper folk. When it comes to pirates, well, considering who we're discussing, the potential sources that could best tell us this tale come in three varieties. There are the secondhand accounts of these pirates through court records, written once the pirates were captured and stressing details to best get a conviction. There are records of failed pirate raids where the participants left nothing behind but a corpse, which only gives some of the story as to how their life ended with no sense of how they got there. And we had the successful pirates, the ones who did not leave any accounts to be read. Much of this was likely to prevent authorities from charging them with crimes later on, although even the most boastful pirate was further hampered by literacy rates through the 16th and 17th century that only went above 50% in a few corners of the world. We should probably take a moment to discuss two labels are often thrown around, pirate and privateer. Notice that we have here a portrait of Henry Morgan, who has been called both during his career, sometimes simultaneously. Yes, it is a matter of perspective, although it is easy to see where the confusion comes from. Both groups use the same tools and tactics, which we'll briefly look at shortly, to accomplish the same thing, grand theft, manslaughter, anything that would need to get what they wanted, each of which being a separate charge should that sea dog face a magistrate. But there's one important difference between them. A pirate is someone who is in it entirely for themselves. At best, they might claim to be part of the brethren of the coast, which was a loose term that pirates in the Caribbean gave themselves to indicate their non-allegiance to a state, each member of the brethren being their own independent agent. A privateer, on the other hand, was no simple thug, but instead a thug with a license. At times when war broke out, governments would hand out letters of mark to captains who would be authorized by that government to go for ships and ports that the letter issuer wanted to see weakened. Often there were specific in terms of what ships privateers could go for. And while some captains loosely interpreted their instructions, so long as most of the action fell under these terms and the issuer got their cut of the loot on average 20 to 30% of everything taken, the holder of the letter would be safe from charges. Now, licensed by a crown or working from themselves, each pirate would ply their trade in much the same way. Pirates would crew a vessel as good a one as they could borrow or steal and would go after whatever their ship's crafts could take on, preferably ones that couldn't fight back so much. And they would try to make sure the fight was as stacked in their favor as much as possible. Pirates would often have a good idea as to what kind of ships tended to go a certain route possibly know better their conditions where the ship would come through than their prey would. And when possible, any information they could get on shores to a specific ship coming by was always a welcome edge. Once the raid was a success, the prize, whether gold or goods, would often need to be brought ashore and sold to merchants who didn't ask a lot of questions about what they were buying. Some ports, like Port Royal, were very open about fencing, but in many places, the treasure had to be smuggled into potential buyers without the harbor master being suspicious. As a result, from time to time, pirates with too much booty would switch to smuggling, while smugglers who needed product would take a piracy. There was a lot of cross-discipline work in sweet trade, you see. Now, the obvious question, why be a pirate? Because at this time, the rules of the game encouraged it. The period where you're looking at here for 300 years, which was when Pirates of Imagination sailed, was known for its system of mercantilism. Mercantilism was an economic system which the states of Europe practiced as they left the Middle Ages. In this setup, wealth was based not on how much land you could grow on, but how much gold you could accumulate. If you had a way to get more gold coming in than going out, often through trade with other countries where you sold more goods to them than you bought from them, you were doing well. And it didn't hurt if you had access to gold coming in on its own. It advantaged the span the Spanish had as mercantilism started from their early colonies, as you can see here. 
Now, when the game was set up to go for the gold, the only real players were governments, which in most cases were monarchs. The understanding put forth at the time was that subjects to the crown were there to make the crown money, which in return the crown would, well, they try and figure that out later. This, of course, was not popular with many of crown subjects. The sheer gulf between haves and have-nots was far wider than what we've seen in our lifetimes, and the barriers between the two were greater to overcome when compared to comparable modern instances. As a result, a caste economics model emerged, which left some angry at the disparity and lack of opportunity. Some of those, the ones with both strong feelings about this and seamanship skills, ultimately find a way to react to this, which gives us what's been called the golden age of piracy. At the very least, it's one of the more romanticized periods of piracy, keeping in mind that pirates act as have been around older than this. In fact, we have instances of uh, Haifa where the Judeans had, after founding the uh, cities, started pirating ships that were coming to and from Rome. And it's one of the more modern audiences feel that can better relate to the pirates themselves. And when this age began, the Jewish people were there from the beginning as both victims of circumstances and agents of change, with two major events occurring in the same year. 1492 would prove to be a momentous time with two events linked in that year. On one side of the globe, Christopher Columbus would come ashore in the Caribbean. People of a certain age might refer to this as the discovery of America, although the current view is that it's the start of European exploitation of the Western Hemisphere. One immediate impact of this, though, was opening the hemisphere's potential moneymaker back in Spain, where a newly emergent unified Spain after the consolidation of Castile and Aragon under Isabel and Ferdinand took action to strengthen their hold on the new kingdom by declaring that all Jews in Spain who hadn't left after the last hundred years of persecution during the start of the Reconquista had the chance to had the choice to either convert to Christianity or leave. Ironically, while the Jews were being expelled, one Jew, Luis de Torres, was a member of Columbus's crew in the New World. He discovered during the expedition the practice of cigar smoking and was one of the Spaniards Columbus left behind after his second voyage at La Navidad, which was destroyed by the Taino peoples in 1493. According to those who spoke about it later, the Torres supposedly tried to talk any Tainos he could out of converting to Christianity, which considering worth things were as mercantilism took hold was a smarter bet than anyone at the time realized. The casual observer might think otherwise, is during the medieval period, Jews faced discrimination by being barred from owning land or becoming professionals in most of the better regarded fields. Due to poor interpretation of church doctrine and a general suspicion of outsiders during the Crusades. What was left for most Jews were fields of activity that were considered non-essential, at the least not very prestigious. These included peddling and money lending, the latter an area where religious restrictions on usury left the field open to them. Now, even before the Western Hemisphere was opened up, rulers of states and their representatives were in need of quick transferable capital, which made the profession quite lucrative. With the advent of mercantilism, though, the demand for financial services, including setting up systems supporting trade, exploded, putting Jewish professionals in a far better position than they had been before. Unfortunately for the Spanish, they did not realize how big a mistake they made with the Alhambra decree, as up to 100,000 left the New Kingdom. While there were up to 200,000 who, who claimed to have renounced their faith for the state proof of religion, the Spanish did not count on them to keep their oaths. Instead of being called Christians, they were known as conversos, which signaled to others how poorly the Spanish thought of them. And often, they tested those conversos to see if anyone was still keeping their old customs quietly people of which they found would be insulted by using the term maranos, which may have been derived from the Arabic word maraham, used to refer to pigs, which were considered unclean. Among those that left, as noted, were many Jews who had the skills an emerging modern state would have needed the most to develop and stay ahead of their rivals, which would prove to be a boon to countries that had accepted them. Among the beneficiaries of this talent transfer, was the Ottoman Empire and its vassal states in North Africa, along with its ally Morocco. As the Alhambra decree came into effect, many Jews were welcomed in by the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who saw value in using people that his enemy the Spanish expelled against them. Among those in service of the Sultan was Haredin Barbarossa, a Corsair captain who would ultimately be appointed by Suleiman as Grand Admiral of the Ottoman fleet. 
Robert also is especially grateful for the help from Sinan Rice, a fellow Corsair captain who plied the Mediterranean, descended from a family that was forced to leave by the Inquisition. Rice was with Barbarossa at the Battle of Preveza and helped to win the battle by denying Christians from taking nearby Actium, enabling the Corsairs to better protect the Greek holdings of the Sultan. In turn, Rice would become Barbarossa's successor later as Grand Admiral. Likewise, in addition to his service as a diplomat for the Kingdom of Morocco, Samuel Palache would years later raid Spanish ships on behalf of the Netherlands, an employer we will look more closely at later on. Although his letter of mark came from Amsterdam, his native Morocco had no problems accepting stolen goods, which was otherwise considered just a part of Palache's holdings as a merchant. Speaking of countries with issues with the Spanish, Portugal, for most of this time a distinct Iberian kingdom that resisted Spanish control, owes much of its American holdings to one man, Fernando de la Horna. While de la Horna was called a converso, the fact that he kept ties with members of the Jewish community who kept the faith suggests that he wasn't really into being a Christian. The fact that he was considered a knight of the royal household suggests further that he was well-connected enough to not be under suspicion. He certainly had the resources to fund the second Portuguese expedition to what would be renamed Brazil, so, name it, so named as it was as a source of Brazil wood, a tree from India prized in Europe for its use in red dyes. The second expedition westward, which had among its crew Americo Vespucci, mapped the coast of South America in order to set up facilities to harvest the wood. Out of this deal, King Manuel I of Portugal gave De La Hona the island of Sao Yao, later renamed Fernando de la Nojona, as an impressive reward for service to the king. But de la Hona would do more than that when he used his connections among the Jewish community, those in the open and otherwise, to enhance Brazil's value as a colony by bringing sugar to the hemisphere. And with that act, he had far greater impact on the history of the region than anyone could have imagined. Sugar would in turn come to play a major role in the economies of Europe and the lore of pirates. This was a valuable commodity in the 1500s, centuries after the Arabs introduced it to crusaders. One of the reasons for sugar being so valuable was its inability to plant and harvest in most of Europe, making it an expensive luxury. However, as the Portuguese navigated the coast of Africa and route to India, they acquired as a colony the island of Sao Tome off the coast of what would later become Gabon. Here, they did have successes in cultivating and processing the cop, crop, excuse me, were among the growers were Jews who refused to convert and were exiled here. With Brazil open, plantations were soon set up there, many of them run by conversos, who likely had some contact with the Jews at Sao Tome to help get the plantations off the ground. Now, the fact that such a large group of the community went to Brazil, where it was a lot harder to run a sustained inquisition than back home, under a well-connected sympathetic patron like De La Hona, suggests the Jews who came here felt it was a refuge. What happens later at Recife gives more credence to this conclusion, which we will look at. For now, we turn to rum. Apologies to those who are trying not to. Now, once the crop was harvested, it needed to be processed before shipping back home, which involved refining. During this process, which produces molasses, a form of sugar that makes it easier to ship back in bulk, a byproduct called rumbolium is produced. This liquid can then be fermented to produce a drink that at this stage was uniformly 57% alcohol, what we call rum. Thanks to its taste, ability to calm nerves, and not spoiling as fast as water on most ships a few days into a voyage, rum became a major staple for all crews at sea. While automatically associated with pirates, other seamen would also embrace the drink. The Royal Navy, in fact, had daily rum ration issues for all sailors, practice picked up at that time and still in effect until 1970. From Brazil, the cultivation of sugar would ultimately find its way into the heart of the Spanish-American possessions, a vulnerable, badly protected heart at that. The Caribbean basin was known by this name, the Spanish Main, originally applied to the continental holdings, but over time came to refer to the whole area due to Spain's complete ownership from early on. The Spanish Main for such a large area was claimed rather quickly after the peoples of the islands were suppressed and the islands became bases from which to stage expeditions. The most dramatic such action takes place in 1521, when Hernan Cortes uses advanced weapons against the compromised leadership of the Aztecs, taking their capital to Noctitlan in what has to be called a stroke of luck. Soon after, 
the other peoples of the continent, some of whom helped the Spanish overthrow Aztec domination over them, soon fell as well. And by 1530, the Spanish were masters of the entire area. Now, what made the Spanish so interested in the region originally were gold deposits found in Hispaniola. While gold was the primary objective, when that ran out, they set on much larger silver deposits found in Mexico. And for them, as even though it was coming as second prize, well, hey, that was still good. Later, the Spanish would benefit from the brief Iberian Union of 1580 to 1640, during which time they got the secrets to sugar from the Portuguese and turned the region into a major sugar producer. The Spanish also had the advantage of frontage on the Pacific Ocean, which allowed for treasure fleets from the Philippines to ship to Panama, where they then carted overland to ships going back to Spain, saving some time in transport going from Asia back to the mother country. While there were many advantages to owning the region, the geography of the Caribbean gave raiders and pirates plenty of opportunities to stage attacks on the Spanish shipping, especially the regular Plate fleet carrying large amounts of valuable cargo on a regular timetable back to Spain. Later, pirates would go from Anchorage off ramshackle hideaways to ports in other European colonies in the region to sail from. The first serious loss of land that threatened Spanish dominion, however, took place in Europe. Soon after the Inquisition started, many conversos would pick up and go to possessions out of Iberia proper to avoid continually being under suspicion. While the Inquisition did go out to the hinterlands to do their work, they were not as constant a threat as they had been back in Spain itself. When these conversos learning, yearning to breathe free, a little freer comparatively looked for places to go, among their top choices were Cuba, Jamaica, and the Netherlands. Yes, the Netherlands, which Charles V of Spain inherited in 1505. While the lands were under Spanish rule, however, they were not under their control, and when it become, became intolerable, the Dutch would declare independence from Spain in 1566. The new country decided to make a clean break with their former owner. They became a republic, embraced Protestants, which the Catholic rulers had tried to suppress, and embraced free trade principles. They were so willing to protect and enhance these principles, they issued letters of marks to privateers to go after the Spanish, one of which was given to Samuel Palacio, the Moroccan we discussed earlier. In a new country that was now more tolerant, Jews in the region could be more open about their faith and found less barriers here than they had been faced elsewhere. Amsterdam soon became a center where the removal of many such barriers allowed Jews more opportunity to make unhindered intellectual pursuits. One of the main beneficiaries of such being Baruch Spinoza, who in a new country that rejected Spanish ways, assisted with hired pirates, allowed him to become a lens grinder and write ethics. During the effort to keep the Netherlands from being run by the Spanish again, called over all the 80 years war, an action was taken by the Dutch to hurt the Portuguese who were temporarily under Spanish rule at the time. With the oversight of the Dutch West India Company, who would hire privateers when they were needed, as was in this instance, the Dutch took Recife from Portugal in 1630. With the threat of an Iberian Inquisition moved, the conversos of Recife became more open in their practices. They demonstrated where their hearts and loyalties had laid all along when they established Cajalzer de Israel, the first synagogue established in the Western Hemisphere. But the good times could not last. And by 15, 1654, excuse me, going to get the kissing the gunner's daughter by the end of this. By 1654, the Portuguese were coming back. Anxious not to go back to those days, the Jewish community gathered in ships to leave. While some looked for friendlier places in the Americas, many set up voyages to bring them back to Amsterdam. One group on the way to Amsterdam, 23 in all, were waylaid by Spanish pirates as they sailed on their way home. Unable to complete the journey, they limped to the nearest Dutch possession. New Amsterdam. There, their leader, their leader, Jacob Barsomson, appealed to the colony's governor, Peter Stuyvesant, to let the refugees stay permanently. When Stuyvesant refused, Barsomson appealed to a higher power, the board of the Dutch West India Company, who instructed the governor not to be such a yachts and allow them in, the first Jews to come to New York, and indeed the first Jews to come to the United States. In terms of where you could go in the New World to escape the Spanish, there were more opportunities every day. The Spanish monopoly on control of the region was dissipating. The stresses of having to protect their possessions and treasures against pirates started to strain. As the 17th century starts, 
the Spanish possessions start to get carted away with the Dutch, as well as the English and the French, claiming territories, often hiring privateers for the work. Of particular interest is the fate of Jamaica, which had a large converso community. Come 1655, at the time Manasseh ben Israel encourages Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell to allow Jews to return to England, Jamaica passes into English hands, at which point no longer under the Spanish and with Cromwell's tolerance, becomes more open about their practices. The control of Jamaica with an active group were encouraged, of encouraged professionals, both those who had been there and those that uh, were able to come over from Europe, enables Jamaica to become a major privateering hub. Its principal city, Port Royal, balloons to 6,500 people before its destruction in 1692, and for most of its existence, becomes a major hub for privateers. And although the Spanish would still have a presence in the region until 1898 with the loss of Cuba and Puerto Rico, the raids of pirates ultimately lead to the end of Spanish dominance. While we do discuss a lot about how Jews benefited from pirates in different ways, that's not to suggest that Jews were not willing to go on the account themselves. Again, what we do know may not be everything, but among those we can cite, alongside those we discussed earlier, are some particularly interesting characters. Active in the early 1600s was Yaakov Coriel, a converso ship captain whom the Inquisition turned their sights on. As most of his crew were also converso, they rallied to his defense and helped him escape. Now a wanted man, Coriel went into the sweet trade, at one point commanding a fleet of three ships as they struck back at the Spanish. His career supposedly ended when he renounced piracy and went to the Holy Land to study Kabbalah. Moses Cohen Henriquez is one of the most famous pirates of any faith, active in the 1620s to 1660s. Having successfully captured the Plata fleet when she left Cuba in 1628, the main treasure fleet heading to Spain, he set up in he set up in port in Recife to continue his actions there before the Portuguese took control again. He's next heard about helping to plan and carry out Henry Morgan's successful raid overland into Panama in 1670, which you could probably call a consultancy gig. Abraham Blavé, active from the 1640s to 1660s, had started his career at sea as an explorer from the Dutch. When he took to piracy, he was noted for sailing out with an empty hull from Port Royal and then fencing the goods through contacts in New Amsterdam. Late to the game, Jean Lafitte, who was active from 1805 to 1823. According to his reported autobiography, he was supposedly born to Sephardic Jews fleeing the Spanish Inquisition, which had actually still been in existence up until 1834, though there is some dispute about these details. What can't be disputed was his service as a privateer, being issued a letter of marque by the US against the British in the War of 1812 then assisting Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. But why do we only have his picture to show? Again, not everyone felt comfortable owing up to piracy and likely did not want to be identified. While the individual Jewish pirates may have tried to disappear into history, the Jews who benefited and aided them did leave behind a more visible footprint. In the 1680s, censuses taken by the British showed that Jews accounted for 5% of all Europeans in their Caribbean possessions making them a major group involved with the British effort to claim the New World. They left behind more than statistics, however, having established synagogues that still hold services today. We have Hakaul Ya Israel in Recife, Nidhe Israel in Barbados, Mikve Israel Emmanuel in Curacao, and Neve Shalom in Kingston, formed by the community that survived Port Royal. Beyond this, they are able to claim a major credit for both bringing Europe into the modern era and for putting our perceptions of a romanticized era into perspective. The golden age of piracy, when looked at as a part of the struggle for a people to survive, is a more compelling era when considered part of the greater narrative. I want to thank you all for attending this talk tonight. My apologies for fumfering a little bit there. This is a field study that I have found its way into my works, some of which are currently available on Amazon. Thank you.